Good morning. Good morning, and welcome to the final panel. Uh, we've spent the past two days dreaming about the future of health, and I think that we've decided uh, that despite multitude uh, of problems, very profound problems, everything from global warming to wealth disparities, uh, the globalization of unhealthy lifestyles, and so on and so forth, as we were reminded this morning, uh, it is possible uh, that dreams will come true. Um, making dreams come true uh, is about leadership. Uh, it's closing the gap between what you might call uh, wishful thinking and a practical program of, of action. Uh, we have a panel this morning that is, uh, I don't believe we could have put together a panel more uniquely able uh, to address the question of leadership. Uh, and training the generation of leaders who will be able to think about solutions uh, in the time frame of the next century. All of them uh, are leaders, uh, strong leaders in their own, uh, in their own right. Uh, I'll, introduce, uh, I'll introduce you to them, uh, each one. Um, professor Li Wuan is a professor of epidemiology uh, and the founding dean of Hanoi School of Public Health. Prior to his role as dean, Dr. An was an advisor to the Western Pacific Regional Director of WHO for Health Research. Thank you. Professor Fred Binker uh, currently serves as the dean of the School of Public Health at the University of Ghana. In addition to his role as dean, Professor Binker is also project manager of the Malaria Clinical Trials Alliance, incubated by the In-Depth Network and funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Professor Michael Clagg has been a Johns Hopkins faculty member since 1987 and became dean of the university's Bloomberg School of Public Health in 2005, which has, this morning we understand, received an enormous grant a uh, new grant from Michael Bloomberg, $350 million thereabouts. Not all for his Yeah, yeah the university did. Uh, <laughs> not me, not me. So. Some, Some of it for his uh, Professor Clagg has previously served as the David M. Levine Professor of Medicine in the university's School of Medicine. Anne Mills is the Vice Director of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and Professor of Health, Economics, and Policy. And she has been involved in numerous policy initiatives, including the WHO's Commission on Macroeconomics and Health, and the 2009 High-Level Task Force on Innovative International Finance for Health Systems. Dr. Meng Qingyue is a Professor in Health Economics and the Dean of the School of Public Health at Peking University and the executive director of Peking University's China Center for Health Development Studies. He is a member of the Advisory Committee of Health Policy and Management for the Ministry of Health and a member of the Advisory Committee of Tuberculosis uh, Control uh, for the Ministry of Health. Finally, uh, Professor Srinath Reddy is a founding member of the Public Health Foundation of India. Uh, and currently serves as its president. Uh, Professor Reddy is also the president of the World Heart Federation. Prior to this, uh, he headed the Department of Cardiology at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences uh, in New Delhi. We have about 45 minutes. Uh, we'll discuss issues of leadership, uh, and then we'll turn it over to questions and comments uh, from the floor. And we thought we'd kick off uh, with each member of the panel uh, summing up, if you like, uh, some of the issues that we've been discussing over the past two years and putting it in the context of leadership and a program for developing leaders. And I wonder if we could start with you. Um, what is your takeaway from this discussion and what does leadership in this area really mean to you? Uh, I, first of all, uh, would like to thank uh, Rockefeller Federation to bring me here and allows me to talk uh, in this very, very interesting and important uh, uh, conference. Uh, let, uh, ask me some things about the leadership in the future. What I'm thinking is that the leadership will have to be the person 
who understand very well what will be the challenge that we are uh, facing to in the future. And the leadership uh, beyond that will have to have the capacities of uh, uh, aspiring people, trustful to the people. You know, those kind of uh, skill and knowledge will be very, very important. Now, talking a little bit more about the leadership, what, what are the challenges, I will summarize what you, you, you guys have been uh, talking already is about. Uh, in the future, I suppose that we'll be uh, facing with the numbers of difficulty. Uh, those difficulties may be coming from uh, demographic change, may be coming from climate change and then affect to health, and it might be emergency uh, conditions, all kind of things. And the second thing that I'm, th I'm thinking is that always the public health people are thinking and wanted to, to do a lot of things, but always in the condition that resource uh, uh, is very, very limited, not only now, but for the future also. The other thing that I, I, I would count as a challenge would be uh, prevent, preventions, would be the key for public health. I'm surprising a little bit here as to why all of the pa panel uh, listening here were coming from public health institutions. No medicine, no nursing. So I suppose that maybe in the future, public health will be playing something important for future health of the community, of the population. Uh, so, so for public health, prevention is always very, very important. But Prevention is always difficult since people are not value, highly value uh, prevention. The fact was that when the prevention is success, that's a normal. You know? So that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a problem. And, and people only value something that they can see that. You know, that but, but prevention is not that much. They are not seeing. Since it's normal, we try to keep the life as very, very normal. And uh, one more I'm thinking about is the uh, uh, effective uh, persuading people. It's a very, very important uh, and challenges also. Uh, you know that uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's not difficult uh, when we, are, it's, it's actually difficult when you are staying in the areas that information is available everywhere. And uh, contradictory between different flows of information and then how to persuade people to go in a, in, in a, in a very, very good way that improve their health for the future. I think that also, that's also very, very important. And the teamwork skill, that's, that's another challenge. But the public health people will have to do that in order to, you know, to keep the health of the population increasing. Teamwork skill is not, 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 not easy at all. Now for teamwork skill, we need a numbers of you know, knowledge and skill developed and how to do that. Uh, uh, we can count on so, uh, working with others, how to work with others, who's other here we have to identify. And then uh, the last one but not least is about trying to combine between the global thinking and local actions. It's, a, it's, a, it's difficult, it's not easy at all. Since the global thinking will be based on the other, on different basis, but local action will be di totally different, especially with those developing countries. So I would say here, beyond people will not, uh, you know, at the same time, learning something, normally a lot of other things together. They will be trained in some vertical things, in diff. And then they will be adding some more uh, skill and knowledge in order to be a leader in the future. For example, they would have to, uh, to, to, to know uh, some things about uh, management. It's very important. They would have to know something about teamwork skill, how to develop that. They would have to know something about communications to the other people effectively. Those kind of things will be leadership also. That's the leadership. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. 
And, and, and one more thing that I'm thinking about is that uh, uh, you should have to think about training for those people from very, very early in their life. Otherwise, it'd be worth for them to be uh, going to university, to learn to be a leader. I was afraid that that might be a little bit late. Yeah, that's all I'm thinking about the leadership. Mm -hmm. A lot of challenges. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you. Professor Bank. Yeah, just a follow-up on that. Thank you very much, Rockefeller, for this meeting and for inviting me. Uh, just follow-up on Professor An's uh, uh, presentation. I think this, uh, between yesterday and today, we have decided on four areas that are, are paramount. Uh, the demographic uh, revolution, the issues of new ways of learning, uh, social and economic development, and uh, I can't remember the fourth one. Um, but it's clear that if you look at these areas where we have focused on in these last few days, it's clear that the leadership will not come from public health. It will come from outside public health. <laughs> and I, I think we need to start thinking about that very carefully. I've always felt that the leadership still is going to be driven by what we call today the politicians, people who are just outside our, our, our own realm. We might be catalysts to try and improve on the skills and capacities of these groups of people, but they definitely have to take the lead. In fact, if you look at what has gone on so far, we've been having a world where most of um, the trends in deciding our political future has been based on economics. So as they will say, is the economy doing well and you get re-elected. I'm looking forward to the time when health will be the basis for electing a new government, where the well-being and health of people will be the subject and focus for most of the debates that will drive this. And I think this will happen as we get economically well, uh, uh, healthy. We, we want to live longer, and we will have to decide on how we deal with our health issues. And I'm sure one way to do that is to try and uh, build the capacity of the individuals <coughs> Some institutions, as we discussed this morning, may not be around in future, but individuals will be around. And if they are empowered, they will determine what the agenda should be and who the leadership should be. Uh, and clearly, our role as training institutions is to support and develop this capacity. And from what I heard these last two days, uh, clearly it also means that we also have to have a change in the way we train people. Uh, we have to focus on the individual and how we get information critically to the individual to make those decisions that they have to make. Once we are in a democratic dispensation, if people actually know what they want, then they will demand that. Because in my part of the world, sanitation is still a problem today. People live in very uh, uh, situations where you, you, you can't believe that people should live in those kinds of situations. But when the politicians go for the vote, nobody's talking about those basic things of, of life. Mm. Uh, but I see that the future is going to be driven by uh, issues of well-being and health. Thank you. Professor Clark, I think it may come as a surprise to some non-specialists to hear that the uh, health leadership of the future won't come from public health. Mm. Uh, what's your view on that? What role does public health have yeah. to play? So first, I also want to thank the Rockefeller Foundation, uh, but not for this conference. I mean, it's been a great conference. I want to thank you for founding our school. It was in 1916 that, the, that William Henry Welch got the grant from the Rockefeller Foundation that made our school possible. And, you know, when you think about we're here to talk about the future, not history, but the legacy of the Rock Rockefeller Foundation is remarkable. They created the blueprint for modern American medicine with the Flexner Report. And then with the Welch Rose Report, created public health as a field. So, so thank you for that. We really appreciate it. And I know my predecessor, Al Somer, really appreciates it too. So, so uh, you know, Fred, you, you, you uh, bring up a very good point. You know, is, will the leadership come from outside public health? And that's why we didn't talk about this yesterday when we discussed MOOCs, but that's why MOOCs are so important. Not, not to educate 
our students, not to educate people, but to have an educated populace that understands the principles of prevention and population health. And so, so I think that we need, as public health leaders, to really uh, promote education about public health principles for people not in uh, public health. So I agree, and I would like to see a situation where we don't have a Minister of Health. Right? There's no Minister of Health because every other ministry takes into account health when they make decisions. And if we could get there, uh, that would be wonderful. But I don't think we will. And I think public health is going to be seminally important. But I think educating the populace about public health is key. When I think about creating the leaders for the future for public health, I think about four things. One is the principles of, of uh, prevention and public health, as you mentioned, you know, understanding the population distribution of disease and risk factors, and how population interventions differ from clinical interventions, and how very small changes in a risk factor profile for a country or a nation or for the world can remarkably change the burden of disease. That's, that's a key factor that I think every decision maker needs to understand. The second thing is data. We are living in a data revolution, an explosion of data, whether it's clinical medicine or public health. And you know, we have information tools now that present us with a huge amount of information. Statisticians are getting really good and innovative at, at separating signal from noise. So leaders need to be able to use data, not analyze it, but they need to be comfortable in, in interpreting it and, and in, in demanding ways that it's presented that they can make decisions and then acting on it. So, so the data revolution is key, and we need to train people to be comfortable with that. The third thing is systems thinking, which hasn't been used as a term here, but it's underlied a lot of what we've spoken about. So understanding that perturbations here may affect outcomes there, understanding complex adaptive systems and designing interventions that improve the, the, the health of the population but are resilient, systems that are resilient because we don't know. We can talk about what's going to happen and we know some things, but we don't really know what the next crisis is going to be. And we need systems that adapt to that. Right? So, so we need to build the machinery that's resilient and adaptive. And then the last thing is, uh, uh, I just agree with what I agree with what Dean Ahn said, is that we need to train people in leadership, in communication, strategic thinking, advocacy, and in ethics. And and we talked a lot um, yesterday about solidarity. And you know, in the U.S., we don't use that term. We have a huge issue in the U.S. about the issue of of what's a, is health a human right. You know, we're engaged in a great debate, but that. That understanding that that as a leader, and whether it's in in uh, you know public health per se or outside, that your responsibility is the health of the population. So if you look around the world where populations are not doing well, it's often because government is not responsive, doesn't see it as their as their uh, uh, their you know um, uh, concern to to uh, manage the health of the population. So I think that's something that we need broadly to educate leaders about. So I could go Thank on you. but I'll stop there. So. And I wanted to focus my comments under the theme of mobility and I think there are three elements with associated implications for training institutions. I think the first element is physical and virtual mobility across countries and regions. We talk about global citizens. We also need to talk about global workers. I think there will be a demand and need for future leaders to experience different settings and contexts and understand different cultures. And so in terms of the implications for training institutions, I mean, I also should acknowledge the support of the Rockefeller Foundation, which built, provided the money to build our main building, $2 million in 1926. Um, but I think bricks and mortar and one physical location will less and less define our training institutions. A different schools of public health will choose to approach this issue in different ways. For us, for example, some of our strategic partnerships across the world are going to be critical. So I think that will be a future trend, partnerships across the world. Second element of mobility is, I think, career mobility. Leaders moving between different roles over time. They won't get trained as I was when I was young and then do that sort of work for the rest of their lives. Leaders will be much more mobile across roles and expertise. So I think the, the implications for training institutions will be that we need to emphasize even more key competences and skills. 
less emphasis on content knowledge and facts, much more emphasis on skilling the workforce for a variety of different roles in the future. Then I think the third element of mobility is educational mobility. Again, traditionally, I went through an undergraduate education, a postgraduate education, and then I went to work. I think they'll be much more flexible moving in and out of training over one's lifetime. There will be a far more self-directed process of training, a pick-and-mix approach for individuals, where individuals are in control of their own training. And I think schools of public health will need to respond to allow students to direct their own learning and support them and not offer predefined package solutions. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for uh, giving me this uh, wonderful opportunity to share. And uh, when we talk about leadership uh, for the future of health, we can go back 100 years ago about the Rockefeller Foundation's creation of the PUMC. And at that time, the, in China, there's no advanced <coughs> medicine, Western medicine. A lot of people suffered uh, this without any basic uh, medical care. So the creation of the PUMC is not only provision of technologies in healthcare, but also a really meaning of the leadership in the healthcare in China over the past decade, the past 100 years. For example, many people from this creation become the, the leadership in policy making, the ministers, uh, other level of officials. They are leading the direction of the development in Chinese medical system and also the policy. And many people from this creation become the managers of the hospitals, not only in Beijing, but also in many places of the country, and those people, through their leadership, to introduce, implement, advanced medical technology to serve the people. And also this creation produced the wonderful, the physicians, the individual health professionals, and those people lead the technology, the knowledge development in the country. So when we look back to the creation of this uh, Rockefeller's initiative in the country, we can see they create that to meet, to meet the needs of the people in health, to meet the needs of the, and the development of the leadership in the government, in the policy making, and also in the education systems. So when we take a look into the future, so I think we need to have the dreams. But what are the issues we need to address in the next century? What's the problems in health? What's the problems in policy making? So what's the changes we should make for our school of public health and the universities? So I think the time to think of the new type of leadership in the future. What's the change that we need to make? It's not the students, it's ourselves. It's the faculty members. We need to understand what's the meaning by global health. What's the right direction we should go? What's the gaps between our university, my school, in knowledge translation, in course design and uh, delivery, between uh, with the advanced institutions like uh, uh, some institutions, uh, Lane School or Johns Hopkins universities. So what's the gaps we need to fill in the needs of the communities and our students' capacity when they graduate from our school in their serving the government, serving the communities, serving the people? For example, less and less students can have the good dialogue with the policymakers. Why? Because our education just the stress the SCI citations, the pure publications. They get away from the real world. They get away from the policy making. They get away from the influence of those policy making 
for the really change of world. And also to get away from the real people. So for, for example, many graduates, they don't want to work at community level. They don't want to contact with the community level. So those things are beyond the knowledge, beyond the technology. So for the future, we need to change for their global thinking, for their capacity in their communications with the world, with the people. And also we need advanced technologies from developed and advanced institutions and countries to equip those people with their capacity in serving the people. So in the future, I think there are lots of challenges because, for example, in China, the demographic change, the NCDs, but our training capacities cannot meet this need. So we need to change. So the leadership is very important, but a lot of issues are, we need to explore. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Reddy. Thank you. The future cannot be a default option. As Tony Morrison wrote in The Song of Solomon, if we don't create the future, the present extends itself. As we crystal gaze at the coming century, we must recognize that this is going to be a time of highly compressed change, where both progress and peril will have very steep trajectories. We have to anticipate the developments and try and mold them according to our vision, and that's where leadership comes in. We can take certain things for granted. We know demographic change is going to happen. We know urbanization is going to happen. We know there are going to be spectacular developments in science and technology, building on the momentum of the past century. Even new developments in education and learning are not going to be a surprise given the speed of communications revolution now. Leaders must indeed comprehend these processes and try and shape and steer them. Nevertheless, the big challenge for leadership in this century is going to be how to deal with some of the greatest threats and overcome them, confront them successfully. And some of them have been mentioned by Margaret Chan this morning, whether in climate change or health inequities and so on. Therefore, if the real challenge is going to be to try and raise human civilization to a higher level in this century and ensure that global solidarity and sustainable development are the hallmarks of that 21st century civilization. How do we prepare our leaders to address that task? Here, leadership is not merely at the level of individuals, the individuals do matter. We are talking about leadership at the level of individuals, institutions, and interactions. And individuals do matter because we do require individuals who are capable of leading that change. But that means, given the multitude of determinants that we are talking about, we need to recreate the Renaissance mind, where there is a mind span which can absorb and integrate learnings and information from multiple sources, a mindset which is committed to global solidarity and intergenerational equity, and a mind power which can actually create a momentum for change by mobilizing multiple actors. And that is where even recognizing the key actors who are going to be change agents in this century is going to be critical. The past century saw governmental power transitioning into partnerships both with academia, civil society, and private sector to some extent, but again in relatively ill-defined uh, partnerships. This century is already witnessing and is going to see much more of citizen power which is creating political momentum, political change, and President Lagos referred to that. And therefore, the leaders of today will have to recognize that even in global health, you have to bring together not only multiple sectors, but also to mobilize all of these actors to bring about the kind of change that we are talking about. And therefore, we do require <coughs> institutions which will actually create that kind of environment and that kind of leadership. We are talking about interdisciplinarity, but quite often that is seen purely as an aspirational objective and seldom operational in terms of its uh, incentives and implementation. So what we require is a change in the culture of academic institutions 
where we are actually supporting problem-solving transdisciplinary research through dedicated funding mechanisms which actually bring diverse discipline together <coughs> and say, okay, what is the impact on health outcomes that you can produce through your collaborative research? Secondly, we do require even promotional avenues to be protected because you can't talk about first authorship and last authorship of promotions without really talking about what the impact of the particular research is going to be. So you have to value group work and reward impact rather than just going by the impact <coughs> factor of scientific citations. So the culture of academia also has to change. But much more than that, we have to really look at interactions. Because we are really talking about engaging other sectors which are very, very critical for health. We recognize the, uh, the interconnectivity in the conversations over the last two days. You cannot talk of agriculture without talking of nutrition. And as Laurie Gadot <coughs> pointed out, the threat of zoonotic diseases looming from deforestation related to agriculture or livestock breeding. You can't talk about environment without talking about the interconnectedness of health and environment, which are bidirectional. You cannot talk about education or livelihoods or poverty <coughs> alleviation within bringing the health element into it and vice versa. Health, uh, ill health also is a creator of poverty. So we require people who comprehend all of these connections and can articulate them and therefore we need to create platforms. Platforms for conversation, platforms for consultation, platforms for consensus building and platforms for concerted action. So the leaders of tomorrow have to be actually people who can create and utilize these platforms for creating a momentum for change. That's going to be absolutely critical. But they have to create coalitions as well. And those coalitions will have to come in <coughs> by bringing in not only the academics together, but bringing in civil society actors and others. We <coughs> have now people involved in health security, people involved in um, food security, water security, environmental protection, poverty alleviation, all of them meeting separately. Where are they actually coming together to talk about sustainable development in a unified framework? And that's where I believe agencies like the Rockefeller Foundation must create those kind of platforms where people at least can engage, identify common determinants and common consequences of processes that are shaping sustainable development and then work together. And that is the crucible in which the leaders of tomorrow have to be created. Thank you. Um, Professor Reddy spoke of the need for renaissance men and women to drive healthcare change. And the question I have is, are our schools of public health up to the challenge? And if not, what needs to change now uh, in order to realize that uh, vision and goal? Uh, Professor Clay. Well, well, I think you know, it's hard to make generic statements about schools of public health because we all lead very different schools. But I, I thought Dr. Reddy uh, perfectly described the Bloomberg gift that was in the New York Times this morning, because that's, that's actually the purpose. purpose, is to provide funding for people who are truly inter and transdisciplinary, so who, who work across schools. I, I think public health, um, it differs by different countries. In some countries, people who train in public health are all physicians, but, but not in the U.S. So I, I think public health is inherently uh, multidisciplinary and transdisciplinary. In fact, my arts and scientists colleagues often get angry at us when we when we attack problems, and they say, "Well, you don't limit yourself. What you know, you you do everything. Well, how can you do that?" And we say, "Well, we believe that the determinants of health are multiple, and we can measure population-based outcomes. We will do it. That's why we use that term exposure. It's such a generic term. So, so I I think it varies by school and by country, but uh, but at least." Um, I, I could not agree more. And I think you know, the issue of change, I didn't mention that, but, but when I talked about leadership changing, I think the purpose of leadership is to manage and direct change. And that you know, leaders who, who go into a position and think, I have this agenda and this is what I do and I can only do that, they're doomed to fail. So, so I agree. And yes, please. Can I add to that? Because I wanted to build also on Professor Mung's comments, because I think it's not just the transdisciplinary, multidisciplinary approach to training. It's also facilitating people moving between academia and policy and practice roles, because I think a critical issue about improving health is that you need the practical experience as well as the academic research experience and enabling people to understand both those worlds I think will be critical in this renaissance person. Please. Yeah, uh, we are talking about uh, something about changing. 
Uh, I totally agree that if we are facing with new uh, sort of setting, we have to change ourselves. So changing is must. Uh, and what, what will change? What I'm thinking is that uh, now, go back to the history of, uh, of, of uh, uh, Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, we sometimes seeing that, you know, linking very, very closely with reality is the uh, was of fashion sometimes. And then, and research uh, fundings came toward laboratory and some very sophisticated research, and then link up with the field become less. And then later on become uh, uh, increasing. You know, like a wave, uh, depend on the funding. And what I'm thinking is that uh, now we have to link very, very, very closely with the field. That will be changing again now. Um, uh, I would say that I thank Rockefeller uh, Foundation again and again because when Vietnam first uh, the, for the first time developing public health training system, our school has been selected, and we got support from Rockefeller Foundation from very beginning of that. And when developing the school public health, we are thinking immediately about how to link up the school to reality by applying the new way that the core that time is a public health school without world. That, that's, a, that's, a, that, that's a fundamental. And we opened a very, very first course for MPH that time, that 50% of our students will be in the field and link up with the school by email system. So that's very, very new to Vietnam. And that's the reason why we later on has been upgraded ourselves as a uni staying alone university of public health in Vietnam, our language. So that, that's a very, very important that the faculty will have to change their behavior toward not only working in ivory tower in, in the city, but have to go to the field. And the student also will have to go to the field. And working with the people in the field who get idea, who get solution, who get everything. That, that's a very, very important. Uh, for, you know, uh, changing what I'm saying. But, but it's not change, right? It's really was like a link very, very closely with the field from uh, uh, Dr. Rose, Wick Rose from Rockefeller Foundation, as I know from very beginnings of developing uh, public health by Rockefeller Foundation. Yeah, that, that's what I'm, I'm learning. And try, of course, we have to link up with the new advancements of technology, for example, uh, internet uh, usings and something like that. That's important. So now our experience is that we create, uh, even though we are academic uh, institution, but we immediately saying that, thinking that we have to, th to create some sort of uh, CSO, so, 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 so civil organizations. We call that VPHA, that's the Vietnam Public Health Association. And now it plays play a very, very important role in something people call right now is that reform of health professional education, where we can bring our students, our faculty to work with the, uh, with the uh, CSO, VPHA, very effectively. We'll be willing to, to work with not only school public health, but through, throughout the whole country with other school medicine faculties and public health throughout the whole country. That's my experience. Thank you. Yeah, so I think, yeah, we, we need to do some of what we're doing now, but we need to uh, add a lot more to that. And we have to look at the change in the focus. If our focus is to try and educate the individuals and the public, then we're not doing as well as we've been doing in the past. Mm -hmm. We have to use the new media. There's no reason why uh, students should not be engaged in the world of uh, the internet. Uh, text messaging, and so on. People must have a way of getting the information that allows them to promote health and create health. And I think some of that is not being done now. We need to re-emphasize that and create that to actually empower the, 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 the population to make those choices and to put the health as a primary lesson on the agenda. In addition to that, I think we should also look back at uh, industry and commerce. I always go back there. Uh, there are not enough schools of public health 
on, on the continent, especially where I come from in Africa. I mean, you could see the proliferation of uh, schools of uh, business in, in the last two decades where you had all these MBAs being offered from every nook and cranny of the world. We need to increase training in public health across disciplines and engage these people to try and make a change in the behaviors of people by empowering them to create health and well-being, as we discussed in the last two days. So I think there must be some change, both in, in, in the direction of the schools. I mean, we, we don't need to uh, put away all that we're doing now. Yes, this is also required to build a scientific basis, but then there must be new frontiers to try and address our, our target of the masses of populations in trying to empower them to improve on their health. You talked about social media, and we've heard a lot about massive online learning programs and so on, universities in the cloud. Is this the future of health education, do you think? I, I think so. I mean, the, the commercial people are already there. They're making lots of money from that. And we always are behind. There's a reason for us to, because most people in future are going to uh, go through the social media to get their information. So if we are not there making sure that we are providing that information, to help them in making the decisions in their everyday life. Like the example that was given yesterday, if your child has a fever, what do, you, what, what do you want to do? Is the first thing to go to the hospital? Or will you want to find information on how I can deal with that fever? And, and so on. So I think that is the, is the future. And we need to train our people to be able to engage in this whole process. But I think one of the really important roles of of universities is to make sure that the information that is out there is accurate and correct because I think one of the problems with the speed of communications is that misinformation can spread very rapidly but then there's also the benefit that that can be corrected very rapidly and I think it's really important that universities for example increase the health try and increase the health literacy of the population but also monitor some of these trends in order to correct this risk of wrong information traveling around. Please, Professor Yeah, yeah uh, I just want to uh, see a point beyond the uh, public health because uh, in China, our deans of school of public health are always uh, complained by many people and the institutions, including the users. For example, the CDC, the Ministry of Health, they said that, okay, you produce the people, educated people, we don't need, or we want to need, but we cannot need well. We can not use well because they, uh, uh, they lack this skill, uh, uh, <coughs> they lack that capacity, they lack that knowledge. But uh, we also complained to the, the universities or the Ministry of Education because they just use the criteria to assess the performance of school public health using the school medicines criteria, for example, number of uh, uh, SAI papers. Uh, so. Such kind of things making our very uh, confusing. We are very important for the future, but many times we think that we we see the mechanism or the system. We cannot do as we want to do. So beyond this group public health or global health, if some changes really happen, maybe we need the mobilization of the resources to have the people, especially the decision makers have a right recognition of the importance of the global health or public health. So some detailed, for example, learning uh, technologies, they are very important, but uh, in Chinese situation or setting, more importantly, how to in increase the role of the public health in the, uh, uh, in the development of health for the future. Uh, I agree with Anne about critical media literacy being fostered as a skill, and I agree with Dean Clagg about uh, systems thinking. Though we must recognize that these are complex systems, non-linear, and that complexity has to be brought forth uh, during the learning process. Uh, the point I wanted to make now is that so far we've been talking about leadership at a fairly high level. We are not talking about leadership, for example, in the practicing medical profession, in public health practice, all of those areas also require leadership. Mm -hmm. For example, we have to train leaders of clinical practice to ensure that their students and further practitioners put the patient forefront. 
patient-centric. Similarly, public health practitioners will have to put communities in the center stage. So that changes the paradigm of thinking which has been in the previous century, very doctor-centric, very health system manager-centric. So some of that has to be also uh, put on different tracks now. Even in terms of science, Descartes was mentioned in the opening remark. Valuable as his comment on health was, there has also been a bit of a downside to Cartesian reductionism. So we have to train our researchers to recognize that the spectrum of science is reductionist in content, but holistic in context. And therefore, that vision of science also must change. So there has to be leadership built at multiple levels and in multiple theaters of action, not just at the level of global health, which is very important, of course. Before we throw, the, uh, throw this open, the conversation open to the, to the floor, I wonder if we could just address the role of government uh, in leadership. There was quite a debate this morning about that uh, with a spirited uh, defense of government from the floor uh, in the face of some healthy skepticism from the stage. Um, I just wonder whether, whether uh, Professor Mung, you can address that issue, the appropriate role of government in developing leaders of the future? Maybe China is unique, and uh, we uh, largely rely on the performance of government. If the government performs well, we can have the good life. <laughs> mm. So, <laughs> in health is, is the same. Over the past years, for example, during the 1950s and 60s, while the Chinese health situation was greatly improved, relying on the government good policy, good system, and the good coordination between the uh, uh, cross uh, sectors outside health, not only health. But why when our economy grew well, but our health does not perform as well as that? So I think the government takes the leading role. So the good side and bad side. So if we want to influence the future, the leadership in the government is extremely important in, in this uh, setting. So we always said that in Chinese history, we have no Minister of Health with the degree of public health. Why? We don't know. But in the future, we really hope that the Minister of Health can have the knowledge, education, with the global health, public health. With m so I don't want to say, but the current and the past the means are excellent. But uh, if we take the future perspective, we need some people new. So the government is important, but we need change. Michael. Yeah. Well, I would just uh, uh, amplify your comment. I agree. Uh, I would say my experience has been that the shortfall of government is that government people in the Ministry of Health or a Secretary of HHS in the U.S., that they, they equate health of a population with medical care. And we all know that medical care is exceptionally important. And when I have my myocardial infarction, I want the very best <laughs> medical care. But, but the major determinants of health of populations, it's not medical care. And we've all been in countries where very high maternal mortality rates, very high infant mortality rates, lack of you know, safe water. And when you talk to a minister of health about what you need you know, in this country, it's MRI scanners. Mm -hmm. When that is going to have a tiny, tiny infinitesimal effect on health. So that's the problem I see with government. And it's, it's, it takes off on your comments about having some training in public health is, is mistakenly equating medical care with health. Yeah, I think the I mean, governments will continue to have a big role to play. Mm -hmm. But I think the caveat is that we have to empower the people that hold government accountable. Mm -hmm. This is the point. Uh, uh, at the moment, I, I, I think, as I said earlier, the focus is on economic growth. But if, like our colleague from China said, we've improved our economic uh, growth, but our people are not healthy, then government has to fix those aspects of what we, we are all talking about today. So governments, I, I see governments as very relevant, but I, I think governments do what the people think they should do. And if you're effective in pushing that, 
then uh, with a strong and informed uh, population, you can influence what government does. Thank you. From the floor. <laughs> okay. Where do we start? Um, uh, yes. Could be good, could be bad. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, I, what I'm taking is that uh, leadership challenge is neither monolithic nor zero sum. I think that's the most important point I'm hearing. And it's very important that the comparative advantage of each segment of the leadership is understood well. I mean, the government, uh, you know, the government, yes, no, that's not a realistic debate. They will make the priorities, the budgetary uh, decisions and all that. Public health or the health professionals are going to define the agendas on which they are going to decide. So is this multidimensionality of the leadership challenge, I think, which needs to be highlighted and the, the synergies between these various levels of leadership. But one issue which is related to the, uh, our uh, today's discussion, which was highlighted yesterday also that, you know, we are talking of healthcare, but also it's the issue of health. Now, I think the Chinese presenter yesterday mentioned about the healthy lifestyle. Now, who is going to promote that? And there, I think the importance of civic and social leadership, because these are about behavioral changes within society. So <coughs> the multidimension of leadership, I see that you know, is the health sector itself has a, obviously as the core agenda building role, the politi politicians who are more sensitive to these roles, but also the civic social leadership who are going to promote those behavioral changes. They also have to be kept within the loop when you think of the leadership challenge. Thank you. Professor Monk, what is your view of the role of social organization uh, in China, here in China? Uh, quite clear about what the meaning by social organization. <laughs> Sorry. What, what an earlier you speaker referred to as the king of Thailand referring to, to ngos. NG, NGOs. NGO is, sorry, oh, it's a very <laughs> difficult definition in China. And uh, yeah, in the future, if what I have the dreams for the future, I think NGO should take more important role in the country mm. to share the responsibilities from other organizations, including, including government. Uh, but this is a very tough question because it related to other the policies or systems change. I'm looking forward, but uh, I, I cannot see well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sorry, this gentleman here, please. Thank you, my name is Joseph Wangombe from Nairobi. I want to throw these two in. They have not come up in our discussions, but I think uh, for me, they have something to do with the leadership. Uh, when I dream today, I dream in my mother tongue and translate into English. But am I right to say that the world is converging on choosing a global language? And am I sensing that English is becoming a global language? Does it have something to do with the leadership in the future? And how is it by default that English became the language that we speak everywhere? Mm -hmm. Does it have something to do with that? Mm -hmm. it, it might have an effect on our dreams and to where we are going. English. The next one is uh, 100 years ago, Rockefeller Foundation was almost alone. Uh, you may have counted five such foundations in the world. Today, there have emerged such global organizations wielding a lot of resources and a lot of power. I mean, you can count, yes, the Americans ones are obvious, Rockefeller, we have uh, Bill at Merida Gates and, uh, and so on, Clinton. But they are emerging. We have Chinese ones now coming and others. Now, how are they going to affect? Are they going to influence the leadership of public health tomorrow? I think these are major issues that they are wielding a lot of resources. The direction of their thinking is going to affect <coughs> where we go, what programs we put together and so on. I think the eminent panelists might be able to comment uh, on these two. Perhaps. Please. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think this is quite important, and they, they definitely have a role to play uh, as we go forward. 
uh, I'm, I'm not going to discuss the issue about the English, but I'm talking about the foundations. Um, I, I think they also have to reorient their role. Uh, in recent times, they focused mainly on uh, supporting interventions uh, in uh, most of the uh, low-income countries and so on. But they've all shied away from investing in training and education. This must change because knowledge and education is power. So if you don't invest in those things and you're only investing in the means to improve on health, then you don't have the people who will make those changes and make us get uh, the maximum impact of our interventions. So I expect that their roles will continue, but they need to go back and continue to invest in education and training. Michael. So, uh, so Joseph, I, I had uh, the same thought. You know, if you, if you look at the Rockefeller Foundation and what, it's a, it's a crowded field now, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the foundation world. And, and often, you know, as you say, some of those foundations, uh, the Gates Foundation has, has a lot of money. I, I think the threat to the Rockefeller Foundation is if you look at what they've done, they changed the rules, right? They just changed the world. Uh, and not necessarily with a whole lot of money. You know, the Flexner Report was one FTE for a year. Uh, and so I would say, you, you may not want my advice, my advice to the Rockefeller Foundation would be, don't be paralyzed by the competition. Think bold as you have in the past. Think big and change the rules. Sorry, this lady here. Um, if we really want to achieve all the dreams that we have dreamt during the two days, I think leadership should change. Leadership definitely shouldn't be with the we public health professionals and the Ministry of Health. Leadership should be decentralized. Leadership should be at community level, at the youth level, at the women level. We need to have leaders from all these groups that we can consult, as Professor Reddy has said, for, in a forum for consultation. But leadership should be also multi-sectorial. We should have health leaders in the Ministry of Finance. We should have health leaders in the Ministry of Commerce, in the Ministry of Water, and everywhere. But we should have also leaders in the private sector, in the civil society. It should be really multi-sectorial, and all these people should be uh, consulted. But we also need accountability. It's good to be leaders, yeah. but who are we accountable to? So we need to hold the leaders accountable at all the levels. Thank you. It's difficult. Please. pleasures of being 100 years old and uh, having amazing archives has been the ability for this last year to go through them. And we've had the opportunity to read the diaries of the program officers as they were thinking about creating the fields of public health, the schools of public health. And they visited several notable, notable medical schools, which will go unnamed. And they were convinced that none of those medical schools would be the right place for this new field. And so they created at Hopkins, at Harvard, at, and, and others, a school of public health. What makes you think that schools of public health are the right places for the next century? Are you as <laughs> arcane as they found medical schools 100 years ago <laughs> when they were thinking about what would be the wave of the future. You talk about situational variables, Michael, and so maybe the business school that's going to train the next CEO of Unilever or Pepsi-Cola would be a better place for really moving the needle in terms of what the health issues. Maybe the School of Environmental Sciences that is training the next climate change leader is going to be the right place for really moving the needle for what the 21st century challenge is. How do you know? Dr. Red, sorry. We'll start with Dr. Red, and we'll come to you. In the 20th century, medicine evolved to come under the overall framework of public health. 
In the 21st century, public health and nutrition must evolve to come under the overall framework of sustainable development. And if that has to happen, clearly public health has to be one of the key players in setting an agenda. But it has to work in concert with multiple other institutions, mm -hmm. whether it is business schools or schools of environmental sciences, but to ensure that they do not work in silos. The bottom line of business management is performance and profit. The bottom line of public health management is performance and equity. Mm -hmm. So these have to be unified. Mm -hmm. So you have to ensure mm -hmm. that they do not lose track as we are moving along that trajectory. Mm -hmm. So we do require that. Now, coming back to one of the previous questions, what can the Rockefeller Foundation do somewhat differently even when there are other big players? The whole area of health impact assessment of policies in other sectors, policies and programs in other sectors, there's virtually no capacity in any country, very few academic institutions, very mini few ministries deal with that. Whereas environmental impact assessment is happening now. Now we need to build that capacity and ensure that policies, whether in agriculture or urban development or elsewhere, do not go awry so that we in the health field are not the mopping brigade picking up the mess created by them. So it is that health impact assessment that is absolutely critical. The other gap area is knowledge translation. We had about three to four centuries between the time it was discovered that lime and lemon juice were useful for preventing scurvy before the actual eradication of scurvy. Even now, we find a huge lag time between the creation of knowledge and its application. We ought to be able to train leaders in shortening the knowledge translation time so that we do not miss a million opportunities for improving health. And you wanted to say something. Yes, I want to. I mean, I think the answer is we don't know what the best organizational structure is for generating knowledge, generating leadership. But I think there is indeed a major problem with schools of public health, and I would include ours in it, even though we don't call ourselves a school of public health, um, in that we are indeed a silo. And for us, what has been critical is at least we exist within the umbrella of the University of London. It's to reach out to our neighbors to work across the University of London campus. But I think that, and I know in the, in the US there's been a lot of um, uh, working across faculties. Obviously a multi-faculty university can take advantage of that. But I think it's absolutely critical that we break down those walls around the schools of public health in the future. So we had a question from the back. I need to take a question from the back, otherwise I'll be accused of front row bias. I think you can all hear me okay. Thank you. Um, first, I want to say that in those, in my many years of, of viewing public health as an outsider looking at it, I have seen that one of the greatest failures of public health leadership is that it's zealous. You already <laughs> believe in public health. You believe in your principles. You believe that they're right and true and correct and supremely important. And most of the politicians and communities that you talk to don't agree with you. Right. <laughs> I just had an interesting conversation here in Beijing with a man I was discussing the air pollution in Beijing and saying, you know, you must be very worried about this and your respiratory health. And he said, no, we're worried about prosperity. Right. And that comes first. Yeah. So we're, we're starting with the assumption that if we opened the whole world of global health up to the internet, and the vast community, that they would all agree with you. And you're wrong. That's first. Second, I have for more than a decade been arguing that the biggest flaw in schools of public health that I'm familiar with, and this is all over the world, is that you allow a student to get an MPH, much less a PhD, without knowing a single thing about government. So they don't know how a bill gets written and how it gets passed. They don't know how their city legislature works. They have no idea what the structure is of their government. And they're supposed to go out and essentially carry out a government activity, which is what most public health is. And they're utterly useless. They end up <laughs> learning it on the job, usually by blundering terribly for a long time and eventually figuring out how to do it. And that should be corrected. I think it's inexcusable for any school of public health to give a degree mm -hmm. without requiring basic knowledge of governance. Um, and then finally, I, I want to point out that we're, we're talking here about leadership, and it's been coming down to sort of the kind of leadership for health that comes out of schools of public health. But we have to confess that at this moment, we have a crisis on the macro level of global health leadership. 
We have seen the entire architecture of global health leadership rearranged in the last 15 years in such a way that WHO now has a budget equal to what it had in 1990. <coughs> if you look at where WHO ranks in the leadership structure, it's way behind Gavi, for example, and the Global Fund to fight AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation's role, and so on. What this means is that this, the architecture of global health, ergo its leadership, is being determined by where the money goes, not by where the needs are. So now we're about to have this big debate next year about whether or not universal health coverage should be the prime goal in the post-2015 world. Where in that global health architecture do you see the leadership that would design the structures of universal health coverage and health systems management? If you're sitting in a poor country today and you want to know, how do I develop a financing scheme? Are you going to find that from WHO? Are you going to find that from the Global Fund, from Gavi, from all these well-funded institutions? No, because they're all silos. They're all vested interests plowing leadership down specific paths. So I think if you really want to go to the future and say, where should global health be going? You have to reconsider the, the, the whole way that we structure this thing that we call global health. Thank you. Dr. Frank, I know you wanted to say something wrong, blundering, stupid. Any of that sound familiar? <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I think this has been an extraordinary uh, discussion, and I want to congratulate my fellow deans. Uh, but, you know, I think you did touch on, on the fundamental challenge, and uh, I, I think if there's a unifying theme here. It's the idea that we need to re think of ourselves in a much more open <coughs> architecture, to use this term that Laurie just, just used. Uh, it's, it's the openness that I think is going to be crucial. And that means understanding that health is no longer the sole uh, concern of domain experts. But it is in, uh, we, we need to think of health as a social objective. And I think part of our role as schools of public health is actually to sort of uh, infect with the health issue the rest of the university. I think we're at a historical moment of change in the role of universities, and schools of public health do have the opportunity to lead that change. Uh, among other things, by, for example, teaching at other schools, bringing students from the rest of the university, because if we think of health not as one more silo or a specialized sector, but as a social objective that then becomes the objective of the rest of the schools, of the rest of the university, then I think we can actually lead that change and not become uh, irrelevant. Uh, l lastly, my, my view of the Renaissance person that <laughs> Srinath uh, uh, talked about, and I think this is a challenge for all the universities, not just for schools of public health, is we do need, but especially in public health because of its breadth, to think about educating T-shaped individuals. People who do have expertise, uh, but who have the horizontal part of the T, which is what we have neglected, which is the ability to connect across many other fields of endeavor. And to do that uh, requires, I think, and, uh, and with this I will end, a whole new conception of who are going to be the teachers. Because mm -hmm. universities have been very powerful instruments for the social reproduction of knowledge. And if we want to reform and, and change the way universities are structured, I think we need to start by thinking about new ways well, of new, new faculty, a, a whole effort at faculty mean? development. But this is, a, to my mind, a historical moment in the, his, in, in the evolution of universities. We're looking at a complete redefinition of the role of universities. And if we actually do this, if we change the mindset around health to be a shared social objective that it becomes a subject matter that permeates the entire university. Uh, and if we embrace another uh, idea here that I think has been repeated, the idea of knowledge translation and plasticity, I think Anne Mills uh, touched that point, uh, which I like, the idea of, of career plasticity, the idea that we educate people in this T-shaped form, then uh, I think we can lead that effort rather than be uh, uh, relegated to the dustbin of history. Thank you. From the back, coming from the back. Uh, thank you. Uh, public health has traditionally been a graduate level training program. 
increasingly we are seeing many universities moving to undergraduate training. What do we see as the main function and roles of the undergraduates being trained from, <coughs> uh, increasingly from global health programs and public health? Um, the concept of leadership, I think uh, Julia Frank talked about the gap that is really emerging with the next generation of academic leaders. How do we train the trainers and what be the mechanism? Look at the uh, panel and that represents what we see in many African universities. In the next 10 to 15 years, many of the professors will retire. Who is going to replace them and provide the uh, basis for the training of the next generation? Um, we heard over the last two days uh, significant investments by the Rockefeller Foundation in the leading public health schools today from Harvard to Hopkins to London School of Hygiene, Peking Medical University. Will it take anything less than that to really build uh, sustainable institutions that can be the anchors of knowledge in 100 years down the road? What will it take to create such institutions in Africa and other parts of the world where these issues are paramount? Um, data has been a major part of public health data. We collect data, we analyze data, we create information, we use it to guide policy. And increasingly, we are seeing efforts to move away from traditional systems of data gathering. Uh, censuses may be in many places, may be becoming obsolete, and there is this concept of wild data. How are we going to harness this to really create evidence that can guide health uh, uh, policy decisions? So thank you for the four, because I feel like uh, Judy and, and Laurie spoke directly to me. Laurie was looking at me when she used those words. <laughs> yeah. So, but but I, I would. So, how do we know that this is uh, this is good training and the right training? I I would say that, you know, when I, when I talk to our MPH students every year at orientation, I tell them you are under about to undergo a transformational experience, and and developing the understanding of population based medicine, of understanding where disease occurs, occurs in a population, where to intervene. And for example, with hypertension, I spent years treating people with high blood pressure, but as a public health physician, we try to lower the average blood pressure and people with hypertension can go away. They, they, it never happens. So understanding that, no matter what your background, it's incredibly powerful. Now, does it have to happen in a school of public health? I don't know. I mean, because people do it from an engineering background, but but the problem we have is exactly the opposite. So we have, a, we have the biggest MPH, MBA combined program in the US. We have a partnership with the Chinese European Institute of Business Study. When you marry those skills, business skills and public health and understand, it's incredibly powerful. So I, I think technical knowledge is really important. I'm not saying it's not. And, and it can happen in a variety of ways, right? You, you may not need a school of public health, but, but that, that understanding of, of, of population-based interventions, it is powerful, it, it, it just is. Now, w the problem we have with our university is we, they cap the number of undergraduate public health majors because they could, it's the number one major, it's 20% in the School of Arts and Sciences, and they're threatened by, its, by the attractiveness of it. And so we, and we have a little school of engineering in our school, we have a little school of business within our school because that's what we had to do over the years. Now there is the opportunity to work across schools where, which in the past didn't value the kinds of things that we do. So, so I would say that you know, the, the proof is in the pudding. We have an explosion of schools of public health in, in, in the US. Uh, we now have 50 schools, uh, and then around the world we have an explosion. So there, there has to be some face validity there. So, so we, we could talk about, about other ways that I think that why it's important. And, and then in terms of you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, other agencies not caring, you're exactly right. That's the challenge, right? You have ministers of health, are, and we have to find ways. I think the health impact assessment like is one way. The other thing is okay. we have to do a better job of monetizing health, right? To, to make an economic argument to other ministries of why health is important. Uh, so, so, Fred. I'm sorry. Professor Ahn, do you have a perspective on that? Uh, actually, uh, uh, what the gentleman uh, saying is that uh, reaction from the healthcare sector toward you know, produ producing more. Uh, medicine people or public health people. So undergraduate uh, training is actually uh, reflecting the fact that, you know, a numbers of intervention program now in the rural areas 
and it being so such a people like a public health expert. So that's why we try to satisfy those with them. But the preconditions of that is that we need to have uh, some sort of uh, 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 cluster, mass cluster of, of those who get already uh, MPH or PhD. Another word saying is that we may have some, some, some critical mass of people, those who have experience, who have been trained, who have knowledge, taking leads of those people who will be graduating from school public health with bachelor level. And then, you know, hands-on training, on-the-job training, will be following such kind of thing. And I think, I think that's a very, very effective for solving immediately the problem through some sort of intervention program at grad level. We're out of time, but we'll take one more question. Sorry. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask one question in follow-up to Dr. An's um, remarks in the beginning about teamwork, because uh, I'm an emerita professor after 20 years of teaching. I actually noticed in my students, who were MPH students and MD students, that in fact the level of skill in team collaboration mm -hmm. and working together exactly. was actually not going up among mm -hmm. my students. I'm curious about the role of social media in that mm -hmm. trend, but I'd also like to ask uh, for your experience mm -hmm. in teamwork as a piece of leadership because uh, I think we have challenges there. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, what I mean by, by, by uh, uh, teamwork is that uh, the leadership in that is that uh, we consider leadership is not sort of uh, uh, top down. Uh, we are thinking the leadership is about communication between the team uh, in such a way that uh, you know, people often call that as a 30, uh, 360 degrees of leadership. So people will, will look at each other, will help each other, and will even train each other during the times of working together. And for that, communication is very, very important. You have to be very clear when you give any message to other people. It's not only those who are working in the team, in your team, but also with outsiders. I mean from your partners or something like that. So that's a very, very critical. We have a number of stories saying that, you know, since uh, the, the message is not clear enough, and that cause a problem um, of misunderstanding, of confusing, or something like that. And then, the, at the end of the day, the objective would not be rich. So, so I think uh, uh, that would be very, very important. And, you know, right now, we have, a, we have a, uh, 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 information technologies, we have an email or something like that. Even in our school, people try to connect to each other by email. So the ways of communicating verbally is a very, very, is a lesson, is very, very bad right now. So we are thinking that, you know, it's not only using technologies, but also face-to-face -face communication is very, very important. So that you know, you know, exactly the message or something like that. Yeah, that's our experience. And also, you know, uh, we have to use that, you know, if you consider that your students working in the field, as part of your team, you have to link up with them. But it's far away, it's in the field, it's not, not at the campus of the school. So that would, would have to be. You have to you know, drill your skill of communicating using high tech, something like that. So, so yeah, that's about. And we have uh, some courses, not only for uh, uh, school faculty, but also for you know, other faculty to come over and learn on how to communicate effectively. With that, I'm afraid we have to bring our discussion to a conclusion, not least because Dr. Reddy has a yeah. flight to catch. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Reddy, open the discussion, and if I can paraphrase you, if you don't, he said, if you don't create the future, the present extends itself. I think we've gone a long way to defining new ways of thinking about the future today, whether or not we think in English, or in Chinese, mm. or in Vietnamese, or in Hindi. Thank you very much Thank to you. our panel. You did a great job.